Welcome to our Saturday session for AP Biology. I'm John from Marco Learning. I'm joined with, by Tiffany from AP Bio Penguins. Tiffany, how are you doing today? I'm wonderful. I'm really excited to get started today. <laughs> Me too. Math applications. What is that on AP Biology? What are we going to be covering in today's session? So I figured I'd take the formula sheet and I'd do one problem from every single thing on the formula sheet just so that we have a full idea of what is actually on the formula sheet and what they could potentially give us. Amazing. So let's get to work. I'm going to turn it over to you. I want to welcome everyone who's here and remind you to subscribe to our channel. Definitely uh, post your comments in that chat section. If you like the video, press like, and don't forget about AP Bio Penguins on Instagram. It's the best AP Instagram account there is, and she's <laughs> going to have tons of great reviews for you. Um, Tiffany, thanks so much for, for hosting this, and um, best of luck for everyone preparing for AP exams, which are just a few days away. Okay, well, welcome, 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 everyone. Um, so as he said that I am, of course, doing AP Bio Penguins, and I want to let you all know that you are now an officially an AP Bio Penguin. Um, so why do I call y'all penguins is because of the fact that y'all are dressed for success. So because of the fact that you're taking AP Bio, you're already lined up to be a rock star, um, and you're ready to be successful. Um, so now you're an AP Bio Penguin. Um, so a couple resources before we get started, just so that you know the, you know, my favorite sources, of course, me. Um, AP Bio Penguins on Instagram, I'm on Twitter, um, YouTube, and then hitting TikTok. I really don't know. Um, and then the website, apbiopenguins.weebly.com is where you're going to find a huge bank of resources for you. Um, and there's a review guide, 245 pages. There's tons of review PowerPoints. All of my videos between my Instagram videos, the videos with Marco Learning are all on that site, um, as well as anything that I can come up with that I just put up there to say, oh, this might be helpful for you. Uh, if you're a podcast person, uh, you want to check out the Absolute Recap. If you're a YouTuber, you want to follow uh, Bows in Biology. I find that those are the best YouTube videos. Um, if you want a review book, the Baron 7th edition is the best one that I find. Um, and then TikTok, if you're a TikToker, um, Miss Sloan. And then I'm actually not sure what his name is, but um, a biology teacher is also a great um, resource for, on those uh, platforms. Um, there are three different exams, you know. Um, just putting this up here in case you were not aware, um, paper exams, the first one, and then the second and third one will be digital exams. Um, and so the first one's going to be happening in um, less than two weeks. So we are ready to get rocking on that. Um, so reminders is to, of course, pace yourself as you're studying. Don't try to do it all in one night. Um, chunk it up a little bit. At this point, you probably want to do a practice test, find out where your weaknesses are. Um, and then work on your weaknesses instead of trying to study the entire um, eight units of AP Bio. Uh, you want to do present practice. So you want to um, practice in a similar environment to how you're going to take the test. Um, you want to persevere. So if you get something wrong, the, the goal is to find out why you got it wrong and kind of work through those misconceptions. And of course, Penguin, because you're just success and you're going to be a rock star. Um, so today's thing is all about math. Okay, so I asked the students, hey, what do you want? Um, and the students that responded to me said, hey, can you do some math? And I said, yeah, sure, of course I can do math, whatever you want me to do. Um, so one of the science practices, science practice five, is actually all about math, right? Um, it's about finding means, using any type of mathematical equation, using rates, ratios, percentages, and the dreaded chi-square. That is its own standard. So there's a big chance that chi-square is gonna show up on the exam. So my thought was, hey, Let's just work through the, the whole formula sheet. Okay, so what is, you're going to see is kind of toggles back and forth. And the entire PowerPoint is already posted onto AP Bio Penguins if that's something that's of interest to you. Um, and so you're going to see the equation is going to come up, and then we'll do a problem, and then the equation will come up, and then we'll do the problem. Um, so if you're watching this as a recording later on, you're more than welcome to pause the video, do the problem yourself, and then you can use the video to check yourself. Um, so, of course, the first one is mean. I'm sure you all are, you know, know what mean is, but in case you don't know, this N is looking at the, the number of samples we have. Um, I1 is talking about the first sample, and the N, of course, is how many samples we have, and then XI is going to say that all of the different samples. Um, and so what you're going to do with this is you would add all the samples together. Um, so I'm not going to read through all these questions because the fact that I want to make sure I can get through as many as I possibly can. And if you've ever looked at formula sheet, it's literally a one pager on the front and a one pager on the back. Um, so there's quite a bit of formula. So I want to make sure that we can kind of get moving through these. Um, so the way that you'll do this is you'll first say, okay, well, how many different samples do I have? And so one, two, three, four, five, there's six different samples. So your N is going to be six. 
And I always like to, whenever I do any type of math problem, I write out the equation, okay? Um, and I sub in what I know. So I know that N is six. I went ahead and put six in there and I went ahead and put six in there. And I don't actually know these, uh, know these values, but I didn't want to sub them in and confuse you. Um, so this little E means summation. So all I'm going to do is add all of the values from my first value to my sixth value. And so if I go ahead and add those, I pull all of them down. So 104, 82, 121, 96, 108, and 73. I just pull them down, add them together, and then I'm just going to divide by six. So if I add them together, I get 584. Divide by six gives me 97.3. And that's going to be my average. And so you're going to notice that whenever we write out the mean, we put it as an X bar. Okay, that is the symbol um, for mean. Okay. And of course, if you have questions, I have the YouTube pulled up and I can see your questions in the chat if you um, run across a question as I'm going. Um, and so you all have your beautiful TI-80, I don't even know what mine is. Um, you have your beautiful TI calculator that you're allowed to use on the exam. And so uh, one of the other teachers said, hey, can you show them a quick tip on how to do the mean if they happen to have a huge series of numbers. I don't think you will, but just in case you do, I wanted to go ahead and have it for you. Um, so this will actually walk you through step-by-step step how to use your TI calculator um, to do the mean. So you would just press the button stat, then you would go to edit, you'd enter all your values into L1, you then go to back to the stat, you do one variable statistics, and then of course it you tab it out and it gets you your X bar, which would be your mean. There's a bunch of different stuff on there, but the X bar is what we were gonna need for this. So that was mean. <laughs> Standard deviation, um, we're now going to use that mean and then apply another step to it, right? So I'm gonna use the exact same problem here. So um, for this, oh, I should have showed, I'm sorry. Um, for this, now I'm gonna take each value and I'm gonna subtract the mean from it. So the standard deviation is showing us how close we are to that mean, right? So the farther apart you are, right, the more variance there is in the data and the more kind of skewed it is, right? If the smaller this number is going to be, the more kind of precise your data is and it sits amount about that mean. Um, whenever you're looking at a, a standard curve, uh, I think it's 95% of the um, data is going to be um, in the, the two standard deviations from the mean. So if you take your mean and go two standard deviations to the left and two standard deviations to the right, that would be 95% of your data. Um, yay, Danielle, Diana is taking her test on the 27th. Good job. Um, okay, so on this, we'll take each of our values and subtract from the mean, and then we'll square it. Um, and then we're going to uh, do the square root divided by the um, number of values minus one. Um, so again, we go ahead and sub it all in, right? So 97.3 is what we got in the first problem when we found the mean. And so I'm going to take each of my values and I'm going to subtract the 97.3. <laughs> um, and so you see the 104, the 82, the 121, the 93, the 108, and the 73. We went ahead and subtracted those and then you square them. Um, so this is a lot of work that would have to happen, right? So you're thinking to yourself, well, I don't want to do that much work. So there is another quick key looking at your uh, calculator, the exact same steps we did to find the mean. Instead of looking at the X bar, now you're just going to look at the S and the X, okay? Um, and that would give you your standard deviation. So the next problem that's on the formula sheet is the standard error of the mean. Um, and so with this one, um, you're just going to take your standard deviation and then divide it by the square root of your uh, number of values that you have, okay? Um, so again, we needed that previous step. We needed the mean to find the standard deviation, and we needed the standard deviation in order to find the um, standard error of the mean. Um, and so I really think that if you were to see a problem like this on the exam, they're going to probably either give you a component of it and you're just going to do the last step, um, or they're probably not going to have you calculate it. I don't think I've even seen one of these calculations in a long time, but I promised y'all that I would do every formula on the formula sheet, and that's why I'm going through this. Um, so we take our standard deviation, which we found was 17.59. We divide by the square root of the number of values, which is 6. And that gives me 7.18. So that would be your standard error than me. So what you oftentimes are going to see this as is they will give you a chart. And in the chart, they'll give you the mean, and they'll go plus or minus, and then they'll give you another value. Sometimes that value is your standard error of the mean. And so whatever value you see as the plus or minus, you want to add that to your mean and then subtract that from your mean in order to get an error bar. And that's going to show the, var the variance in your data whenever you graph it. Okay. Um, and that's always important um, when we're trying to compare uh, our experimental to our control. 
um, because if you see a overlap in which the error bar from your control overlaps with your experimental group, and what I mean by overlap is they literally are within the same um, Y values, okay? Um, that's gonna show the data is not statistically significant, right? There was not a high enough of a difference with our um, experimental group to say that the experimental group actually did something. It, would have been no effect. And that came up a lot with, there was a B question a couple of years ago um, that students got fooled because they weren't looking at those error bars. So chi-square, which is the next one that's on our list, right? So this O stands for observed and the E stands for expected. And so with these, traditionally we see them with genetics problems, um, but they could be on anything. I've seen them recently on Hardy-Weinberg problems, um, I've seen them with um, ecology. There was an ecological problem in which they were talking about the number of uh, the diversity of the different populations. Um, so they can use this on anything. Um, and so you kind of have to make sure that you can apply. Okay, so the uh, example that I'm gonna use is actually going to be a genetics problem. Okay, um, so in a certain species of flowering plant, the purple allele, uh, capital P is dominant to a recessive. Um, we're going to plant uh, a purple with a yellow. We'll get 156 seeds out. 92 will be purple and 64 will be yellow. So we want to do a chi-square to prove something, right? So what we're trying to prove is that that purple flower was heterozygous. So when you're doing your observe, you're going to look at what was in the prompt. Like, what did they tell you? And then when you're doing your expected, you're going to use whatever the theory is and you're going to apply it. So we think that the um, heterozygous is, I'm sorry, that the purple plant was heterozygous. And so I would have to do a Punnett square to figure out what is the ratio that I would find here, okay? Um, and so we already did that. We put our formula, O is observed, E is expected. Um, and so I observed that there were 92 purple flowers. And then if I added that together, I got 156. And I expect half of them to be purple because it's heterozygous with a homozygous recessive cross. So I would expect 78 to be um, the purple. Okay, and let's do the same thing with yellow where we got 64 were yellow based on the prompt and then 78 should be expected to be yellow. So now um, I personally like the chart method. Um, so if you go to the um, AP, uh, was it the hacks? There was a unit three and chi-square um, error bar one that I did. I believe it was the fourth session that I did with Marco. Um, in that session, I go through the entire chi-square with my chart method that I find to be a better method. Um, but if you're wanting to do it this way, you're more than welcome to. And now I'm just gonna substrate into the equation for today. Um, so I took the 92, put in my observed, the 78 to my expected, and then did the same thing with the yellow. So 64 for my observed, minus the 78 that was expected, and I just solved it, right? So 92 minus 78 gave me 14, and 64 minus 78 gave me a negative 14. Um, errors that students happen to oftentimes do here is they forget that when you square this negative value, it goes away. Um, so whatever number you have in here, is all, whatever number that you, after you square it, is always gonna be positive in this formula. Um, so you should never have any component of your chi-square be negative. Um, it will be positive. Um, and so here we got that it was 5.0 for my chi-square, because I believe it asked me to, to give it to one value, right? Yeah, it told me to give it to the nearest tenth. So at the end, we rounded it to 5.0. So I hope that that was helpful. Um, again, I personally think that the chart method is a lot easier because you can kind of follow um, where the observed is, where the expected is, and you can go more stepwise. Um, but if you are a plug in the formula type person, there's your plug in the formula. Um, so oftentimes when we get our chi-square, they're gonna ask us to analyze it. And this chi-square table is actually on the formula sheet. All I did is I pulled the data straight from the formula sheet. Um, and so there's two p-values. You'll have a p-value of 0 0.05 um, and then a point value of point, p-value of 0 0.01. All this is saying is your confidence. You have a 95% confidence and a 99% confidence. Traditionally, we're going to use the 0 0.05 unless they say that we should use a different one. So they'll give you some information in the prompt that would tell you, oh, no, I'm going to do the 99%. But traditionally, we do the, the 95% or the 0 0.05. So if I look here, um, I'm going to do my degree of freedom, which is going to be N minus 1. So I had two different things. I had purple or I had yellow, right? So there was N was 2. So my degree of freedom is N minus 1. So I'm going to look at, ooh, sorry, I'm going to look right here under degree of freedom one, 0.05, and I'm saying, okay, 
3.84, okay? That number is actually um, less than the number I calculated, which means that I'm going to reject my null hypothesis, okay? Um, the heterozygous plant is not heterozygous um, because I did not get that 50-50 ratio. There must be something else at play or it's not heterozygous. So, whoo, got chi-square. Um, so next we have is our laws of probability. Um, so with this, we usually see this with our genetics problems. Nice connection from the chi-square, right? Um, and so um, oftentimes I just find that students accidentally do this without even realizing that they're applying these formulas, right? Um, so we have smooth is dominant to wrinkled, purple is dominant to white. Um, if I do a dihybrid cross, what would be my phenotype, right? Um, so if I did my cross, I see that I have one that is um, smooth because it's homozygous dominant. And then I see that two of them are going to be smooth because they're heterozygous. So if I want to know overall how many of them were smooth, I would say that, well, three fourths of them are smooth because I have my one fourth plus my one half, which is this first statement right here where it says that A and B are mutually exclusive. Basically, they came from the same reproductive event. They're from the same exact event. Um, and so I would add the probabilities of them. So the probability of homozygous dominant plus the probability of heterozygous gives me the probability of being smooth. Um, and so I just added that. So you actually unintentionally usually do that math without even thinking about it, but it's okay. Um, and so then if we do the exact same thing for our um, purple, we would say that, okay, well, the one fourth is purple and then plus the one half that's purple because there's heterozygous um, is gonna give me three fourths. Um, and so then we go to the second formula where it says if A and B are independent. So the smooth had no interaction with the color. Um, and so we would do these ratios separately. Um, and so I would take the probability of my smooth times the probability of my purple and I'd multiply them together. So three fourths times three fourths gives you nine sixteenths. Um, three fourths of the smooth times the one fourth of the white gives you three sixteenths. Uh, same thing with a wrinkled, one fourth from the wrinkled times the three fourths of the purple gave you three sixteenths. And then uh, wrinkled and white gave you one fourth times one fourth. It gave you one sixteenth. So all we did is we just multiplied these ratios together, um, which gave you your probability of both of them because they were independent events. Whew, Hardy Weinberg, another one of y'all's favorite uh, of formulas. Um, so on this, we have a couple different values, right? So P is going to be frequency of the allele one, and that is directly off of the um, formula sheet. It, they tell you that P is the allele one. Okay, your teacher probably told you that P was your dominant allele, which is perfectly fine. That's how I teach my students also. Um, but it doesn't have to be the dominant. It just has to be one of the alleles. Um, and then the same thing with Q. Q is going to be the frequency of allele two, which we traditionally call the recessive allele. Okay. Um, and so when you're looking at the equation, you say that, well, the frequency of the dominant allele plus frequency of the recessive allele, because there are only two in our equation, um, that should give me 100% of the population. So they usually have either have the dominant or the recessive allele, if we're looking at those alleles. So then if I say that, okay, well, I have two of these dominant alleles, that's going to be P squared, because I have P times P, which should give me P squared. So P squared would be the frequency of having homozygous allele one, um, and then which we call homozygous dominant. And then if I was to have two of the recessive alleles, so Q times Q gives you Q squared, um, that would be the frequency of homozygous for allele two, which would be your homozygous recessive. Um, and then if I wanted to say, okay, well, the heterozygote, heterozygotes have one of the allele one and one of the allele twos. So I would say, well, two PQ is my um, heterozygous. And is actually, if you were to think about a monohybrid cross, you can actually put a PQ times a PQ and actually like make that this top formula. Where if we take our homozygous recessive, sorry, homozygous recessive plus our heterozygous plus our homozygous dominant, it should add to 100%. And remember, if you have questions, you're more than welcome to put that down into that chat. I'd be happy to help you as we talk through these. So I, again, like to do a chart. Chart just makes more sense to me and it makes my math a lot easier to follow. Um, I find that as I'm working through math, sometimes I get lost. Um, so we have this uh, formula, I'm sorry, this uh, population of uh, penguins. 15% um, are going to have smooth feathers. And so uh, the smooth is the recessive allele. Um, and so as we said a second ago, the recessive allele and having a trait of recessive means that you have two of those recessive alleles. So the first value, that 15%, is gonna go into Q squared. Now, 
whenever you're solving any of these problems, you always want to start with Q squared. So even if the question told you that 85% of them were fluffy, you would not say, oh, P squared, because the dominant phenotype can either be homozygous dominant or heterozygous. So you never want to start with that dominant phenotype. So always start with Q squared when you solve these problems. So if we have our Q squared, I say, okay, well, if I know Q squared, I can find Q. The way that I can find Q is I do the square root of Q squared, which gives me just straight Q. So the square root of 15 should give you 0.39. And now that I have Q, I can say, okay, well, P plus Q equals one, right? So I would say one minus 39, which should give you um, 0.61. And then, uh, so whenever I have my P, I need to do my P squared. I would then do 0.61 squared, which would give you 0.37. And then two PQ would just be two times my P times my Q, which gives you 0.48. So my answer for this for would be 0.5. Um, so somebody said, um, are you going to show me the calculations? Um, so the calculation for the um, chi-square, the only way to do it on your calculator um, would be to do a chart method within the calculator. Um, so you would have to type in all the steps that you would do by hand. Um, so I didn't really think that was valuable for me to put that on my PowerPoint. Um, and then basically from the, the statistics stuff on, there really wasn't anything that I had quick keys in your calculator because it's mostly just plug and chug. Um, somebody says for chi-square, you just did, why did I reject the heterozygous? Because of the fact that it wasn't heterozygous. Um, so I'm saying like the, the null hypothesis stated that um, you were going to be, that the, um, the, the purple one was going to be heterozygous. Um, and because of the fact that it didn't fall within a certain range of the ratios that we should have gotten, um, I reject that null. I reject the null hypothesis that it is a heterozygous. It must be some other component that was causing that. Um, and yes, you're allowed to bring your calculator. Any calculator, there's not many that are rejected. Um, and the p-value we used on that was 0 0.05. Um, so this formula that we're about to see right now with Hardy-Weinberg is not on the formula sheet. It is not on the formula sheet. And I will tell you right now in the practice exam, there is a question that is tripping up a lot of your teachers. Um, I am the admin of the Facebook group for the AT Bio teachers. And so I see the question that keeps coming up repeatedly. Um, and so a lot of your teachers are having trouble with this question because they're forgetting about this equation. This equation is not on the formula sheet. So I wanted to make sure I mentioned it and I go over it. So that in case you happen to see something like this, you won't fall into the same trap, okay? So we mentioned in the last problem that you always wanna start with Q squared. And we mentioned that P squared plus two PQ plus Q squared equals one. That falls into the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, okay? Well, there's more than one way to solve for Hardy-Weinberg, okay? If I know the numbers of all of my different genotypes, I cannot use that equation. That equation is making an assumption, okay? And I cannot use that if I know the values for my population. Um, so you're actually, when I need to solve for P and Q, would have to actually count the allele. We call it the count allele method. You actually have to sit down and say, okay, well, how many dominants do I have? How many recessives do I have over the total number of alleles or in the population? So this is the equation that I tell my students because it's just easier to visually see this, okay? Um, your teacher may have come up with a different way to show it to you if there's no like official like one that was written up in my textbook. So this is just what I've come up with. Um, and so you're gonna take, since the um, P allele, right, um, is our dominant allele, you're gonna say, okay, well, two times our um, homozygous dominant because they have two of those dominant alleles plus one times the heterozygous because they have one of those dominant alleles. And you divide it by the total number of alleles in the population. That tells you the frequency of that dominant allele. And you do the same thing with our recessive allele here where I see that I have homozygous recessive. So there's two of those recessive alleles. So two times homozygous recessive. And that parentheses definitely needs to be around this. I'm sorry about that typo, y'all. Um, and then one times my heterozygous because there's only one of those recessive alleles and then divide by the total alleles. So if there was a cruise ship, there was a stranded island, there was 400 individuals originally on the boat, 200 have sickle cells, so we know they're the heterozygous, they're the carrier. Um, 150 are unaffected, so they're homozygous dominant, and then 50 individuals are affected with sickle cell disease. Um, notice that I call the carrier's trait 
and the um, disease individual, the individuals with the disease will um, be homozygous recessive. And I kind of added that extra part to make sure you understood where we were going with this, right? So if I'm trying to solve for my um, individuals, uh, I'm sorry, my frequency of my dominant allele, I, of course, I'm going to say, okay, well, two times 150, because 150 of them were homozygous dominant, plus the 200 that were heterozygous. Um, and that should give you um, 0.625. So your p-value is 0.625. So 62.5% of the uh, population should be p. Now, you can either go one minus this value in order to find your q, um, or you can go through the full steps of saying, okay, well, two times my number of um, homozygous recessive, so 50, plus my heterozygote of 200, and solve it out as 0.375, or you could have just done one minus. It truthfully doesn't matter. Now, here's where students get it tripped up. They say, well, can I just take this p value and square it to get my p squared? No, you can't. Um, because the fact that it shouldn't give you the same value because we didn't use the, the equilibrium to get that value. Um, so you would actually have to calculate out and say, okay, well, homozygous dominant over the total number of individuals, so 150 divided by 400 gives you 0.375. Um, your heterozygote, there was 200 that were heterozygotes over the total of 400, which should be of you 50%. Um, and then uh, the 50 individuals that were homozygous recessive divided by the 400 should give you um, 0.125. Um, so, and I believe if you were to actually calculate it out, you would find everything. What was the certain range? I don't know what your question was asking about. Um, so that is the end of the front. <laughs> um, there is a couple other things at the bottom. It talks about mode and it talks about median, but it really just gives you the definition of those. And I think we all know that median is the one that's in the middle of our numbers. Mode is gonna be the one that repeats itself. Um, those haven't actually shown up on the exam that I've seen. Um, so I wasn't really too overly worried about trying to, you know, help y'all with that. Um, and so taking a mini break, so I know we all need a break. And hey, look, it's right in the middle of the whole time period, which might mean actually might finish this whole thing. Um, so I posted on my Instagram asking, hi, John, <laughs> um, asking if there's anyone who wanted to give a shout out to their teachers. Um, so we have shout outs for a uh, Miss Mason, a Miss Taylor, a Miss Nolet, a Dr. Tatum, a Miss Carol. Um, Ms. Jensen, Mr. Roach, Mr. Shield, Ms. Millis, um, Mrs. Phillips, Mrs. Reinhardt, Mrs. Halsell, Mrs. Brewer, and Mrs. Monday. Uh, so, Margaret, did you want to, I'm sorry, John, did you want to say something or you just turn your camera on for fun? <laughs> no, I just wanted to pop in and say hi and, and um, thank everyone for these great questions we're getting in the chat. If you guys have other questions, keep posting them there. And uh, don't forget to like this video on our channel where we've got several other live reviews that Tiffany from AP Bio Penguins has done with us. And as she said, she posted this on her Instagram account, which is AP Bio Penguins. I highly recommend you go there now, grab your phone, follow that account because there's tons of links to resources. I've posted in the description of the video, the link to um, her link tree page as well. So, and Tiffany, have you had a chance to see some of the questions that are coming through? Um, yeah, I've been answering them as we go. <laughs> I, I thought so. I, I just wanted to make sure if there's any other questions you guys have about the digital AP exams or the um, the AP exams broadly, I've also linked um, some of those more general questions right to our um, uh, web website right there. It's a second link in the description. So um, I'm really glad, by the way, as Tiffany, that you've done this. This week is Teacher Appreciation Week. And <laughs> um, this is a great time to celebrate all the AP teachers who worked so hard this year. And um, shout out to all the people on this on this slide. Um, also, just a quick reminder to all the students out there, you know that a week from to tomorrow is actually Mother's Day. So you can remember about the individual who gave you your mitochondria, right? Okay, be sure to thank your moms and your, your world. Um, okay, so back to the back half of our formula sheet. Um, and there was a question that came through um, that said, is AP Bio harder than AP Euro? I truthfully don't know the answer to that question because I never took AP Euro and I was never a history person. So no, <laughs> Euro would be harder for me. Um, so rate. Rate is one of the hardest problems that students have. Um, they'll give you a graph and they'll say, find the rate or find the, the rate of this equation. And rate is just slope the change in y over the change in x. 
Um, but students have trouble with that. Um, and so I want to make sure that we go over rate and how to do this calculation so that you don't fall into those same little problems that other students might have had in the past. Um, and so I gave you this big long equation, like this prompt, of course. Um, and so what we're seeing is that we're breaking down hydrogen peroxide using enzyme catalase. You may have done this lab um, if you were in school. Um, and so what they're asking us to do is what is the rate of the reaction um, from two to four minutes? Okay, so from this point of four minutes and this point to two minutes, what is the rate? So all I have to do is find the change. Okay, so I find the change in Y over the change in X. So I say my Y2 value minus my, my, bleh, my Y1 value over my X2 minus my X1 value. Okay, so my, um, if you look here, you say, okay, well, the Y1, I'm sorry, Y2 is 5.7, Y1 is 3.1, and then my X2 is 4 minus 2 sub them into the equation and I will just solve and it gives me 1.3. So the rate of my reaction was 1.3. Um, and so that's what they are they want you to do is just find the change in Y over the change in X. I've seen all kinds of other ways the students have done this math and it's definitely not right. <laughs> um, so just keep yourself simple. If you see rate, just remember, oh, that's slope. Um, and don't get all in your head. Um, and also the equation that you will see on the exam is just dy over dt. Like that is the equation they give you in your formula sheet, okay? They don't tell you this. So you need to know that dy is just, ah! sorry, my, uh, my son's uh, monitor was next to my, my computer. I'm sorry, y'all. Um, so we're just looking at the change in that y over the change in that x. Um, so population growth, okay? Um, so this d, stands for derivative, um, but we're in biology, we don't need to worry about derivatives. So let's just pretend that that just says change. So the change in N over the change in T, right? Um, and my N would be my population size. Um, and so this time out my birth minus my death, okay? Um, and so if I'm looking at a population, which um, there's been a lot of arguments about this, all they're looking for is how much does the population change in that amount of time, okay? Um, so. So when the question, yes, you would just write 1.3 on that previous question um, in on your answer. Um, you would have, because there, unless it gave you a, a, a rate. Um, so I would actually, yeah, you probably need your units. I shouldn't, I did bad. I should have had naked numbers. Um, so you would have had milliliters per minute. Um, sometimes you can assume, sometimes you can't. It all depends on the question. Um, you go ahead and be safe and just go ahead and make the, the units be on there. So the milliliters per minute, I'm sorry. All um, right, so on this question, um, we're just looking at the births minus the deaths um, because of the fact that I don't know how big my population is, okay? Um, and so all I did is say, okay, well, 40 minus 20, my change was 20. Like, that's all you have to do on this. Um, there is something called an R value. And um, if you wanted to solve that, it's a per capita rate of increase. And so with that one, you would just divide it by the... Um, the population size, so it's like a, it puts it in scope of us because it, your births and your deaths depend on the number of individuals we have in the population. Um, so moving into exponential growth, okay? So again, we're still looking at how that population is changing over time. They have this R max. Um, so as I said before, um, it's not given to you, but R could be just B minus D and it'd be a lowercase B and lowercase D. And that's looking at the per capita rate of increase. Um, so in my problem, I've given it to you. Every problem I've seen, they give it to you. Um, but if you did have to solve it, it's just um, the per capita birth rate minus the per capita death rate, um, which tells you how much has changed. Um, so here we know we have a population of 500 penguins. Our per capita rate increase is 0.25. Um, so just sub that into the equation. <laughs> um, so, and I'm not trying to, to be crazy here. It's just that a lot of these are just plug and chug. Can you plug the right values into your equations um, to solve for them? Um, so logistics. Um, so the difference between the exponential versus logistics, the exponential is going to be unlimited growth. So there is you know, nothing that restricts the population. It, they never run out of space. They never run out of resources. They just continue to grow. That's the exponential growth that we're looking at. Um, versus logistic growth, we're going to reach something called a carrying capacity. So I have to bring that carrying capacity into effect, right? And so that's what that K stands for. That K is your carrying capacity. And so um, that's the amount of um, 
the, the, the amount of the population that the environment can sustain. Um, and so you probably have seen this in your, your uh, AP bio class. So they've given us the current capacity of 650. Um, the rate of increase, again, is the same number. Our population size is still 500. I just added in um, that current capacity for y'all so we could see what would happen in terms of that, okay? And I just plug in the equation, right? So my R, we said was 0.25, my N is 500, um, my K, um, is 650, so 650 minus 500 over my K, which is 650, um, and just solve it out, and it's going to tell you this 29, okay? So that is a different number than what we saw with the exponential growth. Exponential growth was where it was literally just continuously growing. as a lot of a faster change in population than we see with our logistic, especially um, they may ask you questions about the equation, right? As K approaches, I'm sorry, as N approaches K, what will happen to your rate? Um, and so you can think to yourself, okay, well, if these numbers are closer to each other, that numerator is going to get smaller, which will make my overall DN over DT smaller. So you would say, okay, well, my rate is going to decrease as N approaches K. And those are kind of questions that they can ask. They can ask you applications with the math. So they may not ask you a straight question of, hey, can you plug this in? They may ask you questions about, okay, well, if you have, you know, the, uh, a, a population of 300, 400, 500, which one is, you know, closest, we're going to have the, the least amount of rate of increase. And you could then say, okay, well, it's going to be the 500 because that one's closer to our current capacity, which is going to cause the um, change in the population to be slower. Um, so they may ask you more application type stuff. Whew. Um, somebody said, what is the hardest unit in AP Bio? Uh, that is a personal decision. Um, Y'all usually tell me that it is cellular respiration photosynthesis, um, but I think it's because you make it too complicated for yourself. Um, so, Simpson's index. With Simpson's index, again, we see another one of those summations, okay? So lowercase n is the number of a specific species. Um, and then the n is all of the different uh, individuals in the population. I'm sorry, not the population, in the community. Um, because if you remember, populations are the same species. Communities are different species in the same area, multiple populations. And um, then you square that. Um, so again, I wanted to bring in some penguins, so I put in three penguins. Do not check me because I did not look to see where these penguins live. I just used three penguins, okay? Um, so there are six penguins that are the Adele's, eight, eight penguins that are Gen 2's, and 13 penguins that are little. Yes, I kept my math easy for us. And so with this, you would just sub it into the equation. So we see that N is the number of that specific species. Um, and then the capital N is the overall number of individuals we have. So I took the six and plugged it in over the total of 27, the eight plugged it in over the total of 27, the 13 plugged it in over the total of 27. Um, you would then divide, square it, <laughs> and then you would subtract it. Um, students usually forget this step right here. You get so into your summation component that you forget to do one minus. Um, so your Simpsons index for this would have been 0 0.631, and then you could compare that to the Simpsons index of another one. The higher the number, I think the more diverse the population is. So. Whew. Water potential. Do you need to know Shannon diversity? Um, that one's not on the formula sheet. Um, so if they ask you to do Shannon diversity index, you would have they would have to give you that formula. So. Um, this formula is actually not given to us um, when it showed up a couple of years ago, but they put the formula on the like on the exam. Like so, literally, there was a question, and then it gave you the formula. Um, and then back in the day, chi square used to be like that too. Um, so if they give you, if there's a a formula that you would need to know that isn't on the formula sheet, it will be given to you on the exam. Um, and so you would just plug and chug. Um, Sometimes they do stuff as more common sense or it applies to the thing. So like the rate can go full circle. You can use a lot of different things within that rate. Um, and then basic algebra is then on the formula sheet because they assume you know basic algebra since you're at the AP level. Um, so water potential, this would be looking at our um, pressure potential and our solute potential. All you do is add them together. Um, so if I have a uh, pressure potential of negative 1.0 and a solute potential of negative 0.6, I 
plug those in and add them together. Um, the reason why I have this potential is because the cell wall is pushing against it. Um, if they tell you that you're in an open system, um, you will have a zero pressure potential because of the fact that there's nothing really pushing on your open system. It's like if you had a cup of water on your desk, that's an open system. There's no pressure on it. Um, versus like a syringe, that would be pressure potential. Um, drinking out of a straw, there's pressure potential. Um, your cell wall pushes pressure. Um, so all of those would be where you get the potential. If we just see an open system, it's going to be zero for pressure. And the solute potential is coming from the um, solutes in the solution. And those are pr uh, applying a pressure because of their um, basically being in the solution. Um, so you may be saying, okay, well, how do I do solute potential? So I always remember like the state test, the CRCT. Um, and so I can remember this is negative ICRT. Um, it is given to you on the formula sheet, not a problem, but you're maybe saying, okay, well, what are all these values mean? I is your ionization constant. So it's the um, ionization of the ions, uh, not ions, but if you put this material into water, how many ions does it make? Um, and so the ionization constant for sucrose is 1.0 because it's a um, covalent um, versus if we were talking about salt, NaCl, it would have an ionization constant of two because it makes sodium, it makes chlorine. Magnesium chloride would of course be three because you have magnesium chlorine chlorine because it's MgCl2. Um, and uh, I may have just freaked you out. They will tell you MgCl2 if they want to give you that. Um, so if it's not something that we know, like NaCl or sucrose or glucose, um, they would have to give you a little bit of information to help you out. And one uh, is sucrose is given on the formula sheet. Um, C is your molar concentration. Um, R is your pressure constant. Um, I remember it because it's eight letters, three words, one meaning, I love you. Um, and But it is given to you on the formula sheet. And then your temperature needs to be in Kelvin. So you're going to take your degree Celsius and then it'll add 273 to it. Um, so if we sub in the values that we know. So we know that I is 1.0. We have a concentration of 0.32. We have a temperature of 22 degrees Celsius. And then that R is a given of 0 0.0831. Sub it in. I'm sorry. We first solve for temperature. So we add the 22 plus the 273, giving me 295. Sub it into the equation. So um, you put your I of 1.0, you put your C of 0.32, you put your R, and you put your um, temperature of 295, and you just plug and shove. Oops, sorry. Plug and shove, which gives you a negative 7.84. And I said that it was bars because the liters cancels out with the molar, um, the moles cancels out with the molar, and the Kelvin cancels out with the Kelvin. Um, so all you're left is your bars for your uh, measurement there. See, I remembered my units that time. I just forgot on the other one. Um, and then pH, right? So pH, you theoretically shouldn't have to do any major calculations with this. The most the calculation might be is looking at how much the hydronium is. The only reason I'm putting this on the formula sheet, I do not think you'll have to calculate it, um, is so that you remember about the way that pH is. Um, and so if I have a pH of four and a pH of eight, um, compare the number of hydronium ions or H plus ions or protons. Um, so you would sub it in. So four equals the negative log of the protons. To solve it, you would take them both to 10 because log is a base of 10, cross out your 10, um, which leaves you to 10 to the four is your hydronium. And then you do the same math for your eight. So we can say, okay, well, the difference between those is that the pH of four has 10,000 more hydronium ions. Um, the lower the number, the higher the number of hydronium ions you have, the higher the pH, the lower number of hydronium ions you have. Um, and so if you are going from acidic to basic or alkaline, um, then you're going to be decreasing the number of hydronium, um, which is important to kind of think about like your mitochondria and your chloroplast and about the protons being pushed across the membrane and which area is going to be more or less concentrated. So we've actually made it to the last formula on the formula sheet, which tends to be a beast. Um, so there are four different surface areas and volumes um, on your page. You're going to see them for uh, squares. You'll see them for a rectangular solid. You'll see them for a cylinder. And you'll see it for a cube. Um, any of those are fair game. They could also ask you to compare like the shapes of them. And you might have to do some math based on um, the surface area volume ratios of these different shapes to say, okay, this would be the most efficient. Remember that the most efficient cell is going to have the highest surface area to volume ratio. 
Um, and so in terms of our sphere, um, we're going to have 4 pi r squared would be our surface area, and our volume is 4 thirds pi r cubed, and that's, of course, given to you. Um, so in case we weren't sure what those values stand for, SA is your surface area, V is your volume, L is the radius, L is the length, H is height, W is weight, uh, width, and S is the length of one side of a cube. I went ahead and gave you all of the um, variables on this slide for the ones that we're going to see as we move through the four different shapes. Um, so if we're looking at a sphere, okay, um, we have a radius of two centimeters. We go ahead and sub that in. Um, so we have, okay, well, here's my two subbed in for my R, gives me 16 pi. If I sub in my two for my R over here, it gives me 32 over three pi. I would not recommend solving for pi because we're about to do the last step, which allows them to divide. So when you divide pi over pi, it just equals one. Um, so there's no reason to give yourself some crazy bad decimal if you're just going to lose your, like you're just going to get rid of pi in a second anyways. Um, so if you go ahead and in case you don't remember your math, if it's got a fraction in the denominator, you can flip the fraction and then cross out 16 um, and 32. If you go ahead and divide that, that gives you one half because um, 16, sorry, yeah, 16 divided by 32 is one half. Um, so go ahead and multiply across. So one times three, one times two. So you should have three halves. So your surface area to volume ratio for this one is three halves. Whew. I'm just looking at my time and I can see how much time I've left. I'm trying to make sure that we have plenty of time for questions. Um, so rectangular solid, same thing where our surface area is 2LH plus 2LW plus 2WH. And then our volume is going to be um, L times W times H. Um, so again, we are given some type of um, solid. If you were looking at cells, it might be micrometer. They're probably gonna give you smaller numbers, um, but I went ahead and just use you know, larger numbers just for life. Um, so we have uh, two centimeters for our length, three centimeters for our height, and four centimeters for our width. We sub that into the equation. All I did is say, okay, well, length is two, height is three, um, length is two, width is four, width is four and height is three, and I just sub them straight in, and I went ahead and calculated it stepwise, because I'm one of those that needs to see every single step. Um, in case you were looking at this later, I wanted you to see every single step. Um, and same thing with volume. We say, okay, well, length times width times height, so length of two, width of four, height of three, gives us 24. So if you take 52 divided by 24, you get 2.17. Um, if they have a, a decimal, they will tell you what to round it to. Um, I did not tell them in the question, but on the AP exam, they will tell you what to round it to. If they don't tell you, um, then it's going to be something that, that ends on its own naturally. Um, so it's not going to be a repeating number. I think this ends up being a repeating number. Um, but on the AP exam, they're going to, it'll either be a, a cut dry number um, or they'll tell you what to round to. So if we're looking at our cylinder, um, our cylinder is going to be 2 pi r h plus 2 pi r squared for our surface area. And then our volume is going to be pi r squared h. This is really just looking at um, the surface area of the circle that's at the end and then the surface area of the square that kind of goes around or the rectangle shawl that goes around it. Um, so if our radius is 2 and our height is 3, we go ahead and uh, sub that in, right? So our radius was 2, our height was 3. So we sub that in times the r being squared. And then you solve. So that gives you 20 pi for our surface area. And then our volume, of course, subbed in the R with a two. What did I do? Did I add extra numbers in? What did I do? Oh, no, I didn't. I'm, I'm looking at the wrong equation. Sorry. OK, so our R is 2, and then our height is 3. Um, and then that gives you 12 pi. So then 20 pi over 12 pi, again, don't solve for pi. Just go ahead and leave it as it is because you can cross out your pi because pi divided by pi gives you um, one. And then 20 divided by 12 should give you five thirds if you went ahead and reduce that. And I don't think I went ahead and put that in decimal format, um, but it would be, I think, what, um, 1.23. Um, sorry, 1.67. <laughs> um, and somebody just asked in the chat, do we need units for surface area to volume ratio? Nope, because of the fact that you are, um, Actually, you would, because that would be squared. Yeah, you do need your units. Um, no? Yes. Usually, they don't have the units on the exam for those ones. I think it'd be okay.
Um, okay, so with our uh, cube, we need to have the last one, which is our last equation, um, six, uh, six S squared over S cubed, which is the traditional one that we see. We usually see cubes on the exam. We don't usually see the other ones, um, but I don't put that by them. Um, so sub it in as uh, we have a surface area of, um, sorry, a side length of two. So then two squared subbing into our equation. So that gives us 24. And then subbing in our two for our volume equation gives us eight. So 24 over eight would be three. Whew. That was it. <laughs> I went through the entire formula sheet. I really didn't think I was going to do the whole formula sheet. Wow, impressive. Um, so I'm going live again tomorrow with uh, the absolute recap on my Instagram page um, at uh, eight o'clock tomorrow to go over um, unit eight for Q and A. Um, so, John. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tiffany. That was so helpful. Yes, <laughs> definitely check out AP BioPenguins um, and the Absolute Recap, a really great set of resources on both of those pages. Thank you all for watching. If you're watching the recording of this, again, post your questions here in the comments and we're happy to answer them for you. Thank you, Tiffany.